Hello and welcome to the second event in the recovery stream of the 2022 Healthy Working Lives Seminar Series, focusing on the COMPARE project. There'll be another four free seminars between now and June. We acknowledge the sacred land of the Wurundjeri people on which we are based and pay our respects to the thousands of years of wisdom and knowledge found with the Indigenous owners of the land. Woman Jaker, welcome. My name is Associate Professor Ross Isles from the Healthy Working Lives Research Group at Monash University, and I'll be your MC for today's event. What do we know about secondary psychological conditions in workers' compensation? In today's seminar, we have Professor Alex Colley, Director of the Healthy Working Lives Research Group and Consultant Psychiatrist and Director of Work Life Well, Dr. D.L. Fellman. Alex is an applied public health and social policy researcher with a focus on work disability, workers' compensation, injury recovery, injury recovery and rehabilitation. He leads a number of large multidisciplinary and multi-institution research projects focused on improving worker health, supporting return to work and preventing work disability. As well as leading a very talented research team in the Healthy Working Lives Group at Monash, Alex holds an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship and is the current president of the Scientific Committee on Work Disability Prevention and Integration, for the International Commission of Occupational Health. And Dr. D.L. Fellman has dedicated her career to occupational psychiatry and helping ill and injured workers to return to work safely and sustainably, and works with a team of occupational psychiatrists across various domains, including treating, treating injured workers, consulting to insurers, employers and regulatory bodies, and providing training to doctors and allied health professionals. Her current appointments include uh, treating psychiatrists in private practice, uh, in situ psychiatrist at the ATO, the Australian Taxation Office, company medical officer at AIA Australia and MLC, clinical panel member of the Transport Accident Condition, Commission, and a lecturer in occupational medicine and a clinical coach. So throughout today's um, session, you are able to ask questions. So if you um, submit your questions below via the ask a question button below your live stream, we'll aim to uh, answer those, um, those questions at the end. Uh, so please submit your questions um, as we go and we'll make sure we ask our presenters um, your questions. So without any further ado, over to you, Alex. Thank you, Russ. Um... Thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along to this session today. It's lovely to have an opportunity to talk to you about this topic, which is incredibly important for those of us um, interested in recovery and rehabilitation of injured workers. Um, so what I wanted to do today was really give you a, a rapid fire view of what we know from research studies about the prevalence, the predictors, of secondary psychological injury and workers' compensation systems, and what we know about mental health service use. Um, we'll be talking quite a lot about, or a little bit about some research from our COMPARE study, but also we'll cover uh, research findings from other similar studies and from other uh, workers' compensation systems in Australia and Canada. Um, a lot of the funding for this work has been provided through the Australian Research Council, through Safe Work Australia, and through ISCA in Victoria. So thank you to those bodies. So first of all, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit and talk about what we mean by secondary psychological injury. It's a very broad term. And really what we're talking about here is a range of mental health problems in workers who have pre-existing physical health conditions, um, not just um, what we might term clinically diagnosed mental health disorders, but also subclinical mental health concerns or symptoms of those mental disorders as well. Um, so a very, very broad um, spectrum of psychological issues, I guess we're talking about with secondary psychological injury. And one of the key, one of the key defining features of, of this is that it's often considered to occur after the onset of a physical injury or illness. And so within a worker's compensation environment, what we typically talk about is the person making a claim for a physical condition and then some, at some point later developing symptoms or, or a mental disorder later on. There are some very good reasons why we should focus on these, these secondary injuries. They clearly have negative consequences for workers. They prolong return to work. They can um, have an influence on people's family and social relationships. And obviously they're, they're a health challenge in themselves. 
from a workers' compensation scheme point of view, they can um, make the management and support of people during the course of their claim more complex, and we know that they can contribute to costs. But really importantly, there's a lot of potential to prevent these secondary conditions from occurring. And that's really what we should be focused on and one of the reasons that we've been spending a fair bit of time looking at this in our research studies. So I'm going to cover three topics. The first one is the prevalence of these conditions or another way of thinking about it, how common is secondary psychological injury in workers with physical injury claims. And we do have multiple studies now, including studies in Australia, which have looked at specifically at workers with accepted musculoskeletal disorder claims, so back pain, knee and shoulders, those sorts of things. The study that we ran and published a couple of years ago looked at just over 3,000 workers who had completed the National Return to Work Survey, uh, 3,000 workers with musculoskeletal disorder claims, and we found using a thing called the Kessler 6 psychological distress scale that about 38% of those workers reported either moderate or severe psychological distress, with the rest of the, the workers reporting no or low psychological distress. And we've seen similar findings in, in other studies. In a Canadian cohort published about 13 years ago by a lady named Renee Louise France, she observed a, a pretty high prevalence of what she called high depressive symptoms, being about 43% one month post-injury and just over a quarter or 26 percent in that cohort at six months post-injury and in another study led by peter smith in victoria in a large cohort of victorian workers they observed that nearly 30 percent of those workers met their case definition for serious mental illness within the two-year period after their injury occurred and so putting these things together we can see that somewhere between a quarter and 45 percent of workers with a, an accepted physical injury claim um, would we would define as having a secondary psychological condition depending on when we measure their mental health post-injury the timing of it and how we measure their mental health either way you look at it it's a very large proportion of the workers with those physical injury claims having secondary psychological injury here's some of the data from our study published in 2020 and really the, the two bars I'd like you to focus on here are the two blue ones on the right. So the blue bars are workers who've made a musculoskeletal disorder claim. The orange bars are people who've made a mental health condition claim. What we're seeing here is 12% of workers, or just over 12.4% of workers with musculoskeletal disorder claims telling us that they are experiencing severe psychological distress using this Kessler 6 scale. And a further 27% of workers with musculoskeletal disorders reporting moderate psychological stress. So these are people who have mental health problems that we need to be concerned about. Okay, so what are, what are some of the factors that predict um, or that allow us to um, identify people who might experience these sorts of issues? Now, generally what we do is break these um, factors into predisposing factors and enabling factors. So Predisposing factors are things that are present prior to the injury, or in this case, prior to their compensation claim being made. And enabling factors are those things present after the onset of the injury or during the course of a compensation claim. And of course, if we're thinking about prevention, it's much easier to intervene within a workers' compensation concept, context on those enabling factors, and some of them are modifiable. So the key, the key message from this research is that those enabling factors, the things that occur post-injury are modifiable, and they do have a, a significant uh, relationship with whether people experience these secondary psychological injuries or not. Um, some of the predisposing factors that we, we are aware of and what we've recorded in research include things like having a history of mental health conditions or poor general health, and some other things that we typically associate with, with um, lower mental health, including younger age, uh, less family and social support, or being involved in a stressful life situation. Some of the enabling factors are actually things to do with the way we run our compensation processes themselves. There are two studies coming from Canada, um, some of which we've replicated here in Australia, talking about the way in which the compensation claims process is managed, uh, the way the injured worker interacts with their case manager, and their perception of the justice of the, the compensation claims process as being really significant predictors of 
later secondary psychological conditions and mental health problems. And we reported things such as low workability, having concerns about making a claim in the first place after a physical injury, uh, not being back at work and being in a position of financial stress as being some of those enabling factors, some of the things that occur post injury or illness as well. So if you think about those enabling factors, there's a lot of, the, a lot of things that we can do to modify those to reduce the, the onset of the likelihood that someone will experience a secondary psychological injury or the, the severity of that. And that's where our prevention focus can, can come in. Now, a simple way of thinking about this is to, is to think that the risk of a secondary psychological injury is really a combination of those predisposing and enabling factors. So if we can intervene and reduce the, um, the impact of those enabling factors, then we can reduce the risk of psychological injury in those workers. And that's, that's the approach that we can take within the workers' compensation context. Um, the last topic I'd like to touch on is about mental health service use. Um, and really the, the, a simple way of thinking about this is just to ask the question, well, well, how many of those workers with a secondary psychological injury are accessing mental health care? And again, we have multiple studies from Australia, uh, um, including our study uh, a couple of years ago, which showed in those workers with musculoskeletal disorder claims who were telling us that they had moderate or severe psychological distress, just over one quarter of them reported accessing mental health services in the past four weeks. And in another study of that Victorian cohort, amongst a group of workers who met the case definition for a serious mental illness, 40% of them, or just over 40% of them, reported accessing a mental health services during their 18 month long study period. So again, what we can see is that the majority of people who are reporting psychological distress or mental health problems who would meet our definition for secondary psychological injury are not accessing mental health services. This is not really surprising. It's actually pretty consistent with what we see generally in Australia. So the last time we ran our national survey of mental health and wellbeing, which was way back in 2007, only 35% of Australians with a mental disorder reported having access to mental health services in the last 12 months. So what we're seeing in our workers' compensation systems is broadly consistent with what we see in the general community. So the key message here is that most people do not receive mental health treatment, even those with uh, significant mental health problems. Um, here's the data from our study uh, published back in 2020, again, using data from the National Return to Work Survey. This is just the percentage of workers with either moderate or severe psychological distress who reported having consulted a mental health professional. Um, the really pleasing thing about this is that it appears as though workers who are making a mental health condition claim in our workers' compensation systems, which are those represented by the orange bars here, almost all of those are reporting having received mental health services in the last four weeks. So that's a tick for the way we're running our mental health, um, our running our workers' comp schemes here in Australia. But amongst those workers who had made a musculoskeletal condition claim, but had moderate or severe distress, you can see the rates of health service use are much lower. So 42% in people with severe psychological distress and just over 20% of people with moderate psychological distress. So that suggests that um, the nature of the claim that people are making, in this case, the musculoskeletal condition is having some impact on our ability to identify or deliver services for those people, even though they're telling us they, they have significant psychological problems. So just to, to wrap up, um, I think we can say, looking at the research evidence that secondary psychological injuries are very common in workers who are making physical injury compensation claims. So somewhere between a quarter and 45% of those workers are reporting uh, a mental health concern at some point post-injury, but they're not commonly identified or treated. We're not really delivering mental health services to the vast majority of those workers who have secondary psychological problems. And there is, so there is an opportunity to improve screening and service delivery during the course of a workers' compensation claim. And we know what some of the, those opportunities are from this research evidence base. It's about those enabling factors that I described. And some of those are about the way we run these compensation systems. So things like improving fairness and communication in our claims processes. If we can achieve that, we may reduce both the prevalence and the impact of these secondary psychological injuries in our schemes. 
Uh, these are just some of the studies that I've spoken about or mentioned briefly during this presentation. And I'd just like to acknowledge our study funders and the organisations that have provided data to us um, for, um, for this work. Now, I'm a couple of minutes ahead of time, but I'm going to hand over to our next speaker, Dr. D.L. Fellman. It's my great pleasure um, to hand over to her, um, who's going to take us through her, her presentation as well. Hi everyone, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day today. Ross, thank you for your introduction. And Alex, thank you so much for sharing that really interesting and really valuable um, study findings. It's absolutely amazing to hear them today. Um, when Alex asked me to join him today, I said, I'll be absolutely thrilled, four hours should do it. And he said, how about 15 minutes? So what you're going to get today is really the highlights reel. Um, there's a couple other things I should acknowledge today. There will be a little bit of time today uh, looking at, you know, maybe what the processes, the systems can be doing better. And I just want to acknowledge that they're, they're doing lots of amazing things as well. And it's really hard to run a work cover um, scheme and a, um, be an employer and manage um, illness and injury and keep everyone safe. And so the, while the focus is on some of the more challenging things, I just want to acknowledge there are some, um, some positives as well, which we probably won't be covering as much today. Um, and just finally, to let you know, the lens I'll be coming from today is really from, I guess, 30 years of experience working as a doctor, a psychiatrist, and being really fortunate, I guess, to work in very many domains in the occupational and insurance psychiatry space as a, as a treating psychiatrist, as Ross said, but also being in-house at, at, with life insurers, working with work cover agents, working with employers, being an IME and being an educator. So what, what I'm going to present today is with, with all those lenses. So today in our highlights reel, we're going to focus a little bit on what causes psychological distress in people who have musculoskeletal injuries what that does to the worker, how we can prevent it maybe, or at least identify it early. And then if we've got time, we'll look at some barriers to help seeking. So I've divided the factors contributing into the injury, the individual, and then the system. So just looking at the injury, obviously with musculoskeletal conditions, it's often associated with pain and pain is an unpleasant emotional feeling, isn't it? It's uncomfortable, we don't like it. Um, it keeps us up, up at night, it might impact on our concentration and it causes distress in general. Associated with the musculoskeletal condition is often a loss of function, so I can't do the things that I used to do, whether that be do my full work duties or play footy on the weekend, do exercise, which is usually my anxiety management um, measure. Um, I can't roughhouse my children. Um, Lots of, I can't even brush my hair sometimes, depending what the injury is. So that is associated with distress. The actual mechanism of the injury can often be associated with, with some trauma. It can be very traumatic. And I know that can often be associated with a primary psych injury as well, like post-traumatic stress disorder, but it can also contribute to the secondary. And then treatment factors. So I'm in a lot of pain. I go on a medication that makes me drowsy, affects my cognition, or I need recurrent surgeries and I'm laid up in bed. So all these things can contribute to psychological distress. Moving on to individual factors, and I, uh, I guess these are the predisposing factors that Alex talked about. I won't go over them too much because he's covered them, but obviously uh, uh, some people come with, with a vulnerability, whether that's a genetic vulnerability to psychological distress, a prior history of mental illness, which might make them more vulnerable, other conditions that might make them more vulnerable, um, and prior experience. So often there's something that's happened or there's experiences prior to the workplace injury, whether that's, you know, feeling like the workplace is unsupportive or the manager's not supportive or you're not appreciated or a whole host of things. Then there's the, the individual's resources. And I think of the internal resources, their coping, their resilience, their personality, and the external resources that are available to them, whether that's the financial means to manage before a claim's accepted or not accepted. The people around them, are they, are they people who are promoting activity and improvement and focusing on what you can do, or are there people that are you know, bagging everyone and everything with you and really helping you get bogged down into, into a bad place? 
um, comorbid stresses at the time of the injury as well, obviously, whether there's relationship problems, financial problems, accommodation problems will all contribute to an increased chance of a, a, an adverse psychological outcome. And I guess pain catastrophizing, catastrophizing and avoidance behaviours, and we'll talk about this more because I think this is incredibly relevant. Um, but just when you when people become so preoccupied with their experience of pain and they can't think of anything else and then they start to avoid things because they're worried about worsening their pain and, and have a much more restricted life are a very big risk factor. Then the system issues. So I've sort of thought about employer factors, insurance factors, and then the treater factors. So just very briefly looking at employer factors, the, the things that I see come up a lot in contributing to the psychological distress is the reasonable management action. So the employer may be uh, writing a reason why maybe they shouldn't be liable for the injury and then the injured worker seeing this reasonable management action information and getting so much more distressed than they needed to. Um, the role of investigations in working out what happened. I've, I've had quite a few patients who say to me, the investigation process itself was incredibly traumatic. The investigator was actually an ex-police officer. Um, in some cases, they felt, uh, they felt very distressed by the process, untrusted. Um, Having to prove disability to your employer and also to the insurer, they don't believe me, I've got to prove, I've got to show them how unwell I am and that can become a self-professing, uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy, like needing to stay at home um, in the old, you know, when we used to do surveillance, they used to shut their windows, stay at home for six months and of course you become psychologically unwell and more physically disabled when you do that. Um, the insurer processes, I guess, also contributing to needing to prove disability, the contact from the insurer. Uh, a lot of patients I speak to tell me that the focus in every conversation it's about, they feel pushed to return to work and whether that's real or imagined or whether the insurer has an obligation to talk about return to work each time, I think um, that can feel challenging and feel like they are being pushed into a corner or the insurer doesn't have their best interests at heart. And then there's the treater behaviours. So things like the treaters uh, might write prolonged periods of certification. They uh, may not do much in the way of active treatment. The consultation's filled up with the form completion. They say, you know, the treatment is have a rest, have a break from work, stay at home, and the negative impact that can have on um, psychological health as well. Um, so what do I see all of this do to injured workers. And I think this slide's relevant, not just for secondary psych, but also primary psych, but the process and the physical injury and the way it's handled. I see a lot of anger, a lot of traumatization and people's breakdown mechanism, the, their, sorry, their coping mechanisms break down. They, they don't have the resources that they used to have. They might turn to self-medication, alcohol, for example, increased pain medication use. Some people become totally preoccupied with the injury, the workplace's response, the pain. They catastrophize everything. They generalize everything. So um, it's not just that the, the injury happens, but now my whole workplace is unsafe or it can extend even to, you know, the whole world is unsafe and I'm gonna stay home in my little cocoon. We see a lot of obviously depression and anxiety, hopelessness. A degree of persecution and paranoia from this mistrust. Um, so they don't trust anything the employer wants to do, the insurer wants to do, and a lot of injustice. I think a sense of injustice, a feeling that you haven't been treated reasonably or your claim hasn't been managed appropriately or your employer's not being reasonable really fuels that psychological um, distress. So what do I see all the time that's quite upsetting in, in terms of a, a trajectory of a person who has an injury and goes on claim. So they start off with some pain and reduced functioning. Um, they start to avoid things, uh, whether it's work, social, um, other activities, their mental health deteriorates because of their pain, their reduced functioning and the lack of meaning and purpose in their life. Um, and then what happens, they're sitting at home and they've got all this time to focus on their pain and their disability and they're not being distracted by anything positive and we see a vicious cycle and we see then increased avoidance, the loss of meaning and purpose and this incredible pain focus which worsens mental health, worsens functioning and unfortunately at the end of the day sometimes we see a, a really declining mental and physical state, much more than what we would expect from the injury itself. 
So I was having to think, what 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 does the injured worker actually need? And it came down to three things for me, and there's probably a lot more, but very simplistically, they need they need to be able to access the right treatment at the right time. They need to feel useful, and they need to be able to focus on a way forward. So I think they breaking it down a bit more, engaging in treatments, but also in any activity that can promote recovery, whether that's you know, doing everything else in life, keeping busy, seeing friends, doing what, whatever act, activity they can do that's going to give them meaning and purpose. Um, reduce some of the risk factors that are associated with declining mental state. So we need to get our injured workers out of the avoidance out of sitting at home with nothing to do, focusing on their pain, losing confidence, losing self-esteem, ruminating. We need to try and remove as much of the adversary in the process and the injustice as we can. And we need to get help them to not have to focus on their disability. So what else do we need to do? We need to be able to help them recognise when their mental health is suffering and help them in, in, in terms of accessing support pathways. So educating, you know, a physical injury is really stressful. Your mental health can suffer. It's pretty normal to have a psychological impact. We need to so normalise it and also destigmatise it because a lot of these people will think that they're weak. Um, because they're psychologically suffering and they're not used to that. They're used to being copic and resilient. We need to check in on them and we need to show them where to get support. So, sorry, my slides. Are... So, hmm, sorry, technical issues. Okay, so then I tried to have a think about just very briefly what, can the insurer do? I think the first thing is to humanise the injured worker. I was speaking to a claims manager recently and I said, you've managed this so well, it's such a good outcome. And she said to me, that's because I see the person. And I thought, actually, you do, you really do see the person, but we should all be seeing the person. We need to humanise and be thinking about the lived experience of this person, what they're going through and what they may feel. We need to build trust and trust is two ways. It's about, you know, helping the injured worker to trust that the insurer's got their best interest at heart. Um, but also, I guess, have finding that right balance with degree of trust. And I think we need to focus on trusting the injured worker first. And I wasn't born yesterday. And I know that there are some cases where, you know, there might be a reason to have mistrust. But I think we've got to start with a position of trust and let them feel trust. And we need them to help feel that the trust in their workplace as well. We need to help them to access the right support. I think it's really important that we need to have a plan moving forward from day one, what the, that there's got to be a vocational goal, there's got to be a vocational plan, what return to work will look like when they recover, something they can work towards if they're not at work straight away. Um, we need to be focusing on wider goals than just getting someone back to work. So it's got to be about um, achieving their best life. Um, in, in all domains. So getting them socially as, as well as they can, recreationally, um, and looking at it all. Um, just needed to throw in here, I think we need to look at, the, the insurer needs to look at how they gather information. So the certificates of capacity and treating doctors reports, I think that they can probably be re refined a bit more. The current Victorian certificate of capacity, for example, doesn't have a tick box for fit for rehabilitation. It's just got fit for work or fit for partial duties or unfit. So it's hard to communicate, um, you know, that someone's ready to start doing activities that are going to focus on recovery before return to work. And I think some of the claim forms take a lot of time in the, in the treatment room and don't leave enough time for, for other for actual treatment and management. And once again, the insurer needs to be mindful of the risk of mental health sequelae, um, be checking in, educating, and once again, the, it's about the pathways. So what can the employer do? Once again, humanise. We need to focus on reducing the adversary. Um, try and keep the worker at work whatever, in whatever capacity you can find a space for them to stay at work in. Keep them feeling um, like they are able to give, they have purpose. I think we need to focus on the management style of these of these people. Make sure it's someone who is appropriately trained and if or skilled, and if not, provide them with some training. They need to be able to, um, you know, show support, re, um, positive reinforcement, and take the time to listen to issues as they arise. 
what can the treater do? So basically we've already touched on avoiding passive treatment, focus on what someone can do, make more time, make a double appointment for patients who are suffering from a work-related injury because they need more time. They need more time for the paperwork and they need time to focus on management. Um, screen, screen for symptoms of illness and think about pathways. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to move super quickly. Um, this slide is just to say that in terms of identifying signs of declining mental health in, in, in the employment space or insurance space, it can look like bad behaviour. And we need to be careful to think about, is this actually someone who can't be bothered working or is, you know, um, being difficult or is it actually someone's mental health declining? And you can have a look at that later. We probably run out of time for this slide. We might come to it in the questions if we have time. Thanks very much, Alex and DL, for those uh, presentations. We've got a number of questions coming through on the platform. Um, the first one that I'm going to ask, um, I'll throw to either of you, probably um, DL, you might be the best place to answer it first up. Uh, and that question is, uh, could psychological counselling at the commencement of the claims process reduce the risk of a worker developing secondary psychological conditions? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think the answer is maybe. I think, and I, I think it depends on what we mean by psychological counselling, whether we mean the psychoeducation bit where we say, you know, educate that this is a challenging time for anyone. These are the things to look out for. These are the avenues for support, as opposed to directing someone or encouraging someone to see a psychologist. I think it's worth um, offering, but the person's got to be in the right headspace to um, to be willing to take it on and, and you'd have to sort of choose your audience well rather than someone going, you think I've made up my physical injury or you think my pain is in my head. So I think it, it's a great idea and it would be a case-by-case -case basis, but definitely the psychoeducation around what may happen, normalising it, destigmatizing it and giving them pathways. And, I, and I'm, you know, and, and the case manager or the employee saying, I'm here to talk anytime. My door's open. My I think that's a great response from Dio. I think there are some real logistical challenges with this. I mean, we're talking about a large volume of people making claims. There's, you know, there are literally tens of thousands of musculoskeletal condition claims every year, and there aren't already aren't enough people with appropriate sort of psychological counselling expertise to go around. And so, just making that resource available to every one of those claimants would be challenging. So, I guess my response to that would be: we need to go further back. While well, people are, so, so educate, get that psychoeducation going in the workplace before these things occur. And then once someone's injured or becomes ill, the first challenge is actually screening. So identifying people who are more likely to have a, a sort of poor um, mental health outcome and in those focusing our efforts. And we have seen some studies that are quite well known, I think, in Australia where those screening and early intervention processes have been put in place um, that you know about and that I'm sure a lot of people listening know about that we could talk a little bit about more as well. But I think just showing interest and actually letting the injured worker know that you, you're open to hearing about it and validating their lived experience can, can make a huge difference early on um, in, in the progression of that psychological distress. Yeah. The, the, the next question that's come up, and it, it follows on um, a, a little bit about that, and it is, it's very much in my, my wheelhouse. It was The question is about um, uh, what practical and valid tools can claim staff use, noticing, noting that they don't have the skills of a, of a, a practitioner to identify and engage with those at risk of developing the, second, uh, the secondary psychological conditions? Any, any thoughts on that? Um. I feel like we should ask you to add to that, Ross, because you've run a couple of studies looking at that. i um, be really interested to hear what Dielle has to say about what might be practical to use in her world. But from a purely sort of research point of view, we've seen a few different tools used um, in our workers' comp or personal injury compensation environments in Australia, things like the Arebro musculoskeletal pain um, index or questionnaire which, you know, I guess has some information to validate it as a way of potentially identifying people who are at risk for poorer um, mental health outcomes. Um, and then there are a whole raft of other psychological screening tools, um, you know, sort of formal, if you like, psychometric measures. 
and some really interesting innovations in using um, less formal approaches in training claim staff to recognise some of those signs of um, deteriorating or, or risk factors for poor mental health outcomes as well, as you know. So um, I don't know that there is any one gold standard at the moment. I guess that would be my summary. And probably something that we as academics need to look into a bit more. A bit more. Yeah, uh, I think I, I agree with Alex. And I think, you know, with research like the, the, what you're doing and, and education of claim staff, I think we can get a, a better idea of who is going to be more at risk in terms of the claims team actually administering questionnaires or, or assessing, I'm not sure about that, but giving having the time to actually talk, listen. And I think when we have a, a, a case where we have open lines of communication between um, the case manager, the patient and the treating doctor, that's also really helpful where the claims manager can actually ring the treater and go, hey, I'm you know, a bit worried about your patient. Can you maybe book a double appointment, talk to them about their mental health? Um, that can be helpful. Absolutely. And, and to, to share what, um, what we found in, in Queensland recently as part of the Recovery Blueprint project, we, when case managers identify that this person might have difficulty coping, uh, and then they follow that up with a, the short form of Rebro questionnaire that Alex mentioned earlier, most often they came back as in, in the high risk category. Um, so the, um, that suggests that those, those things can be picked up on by the case manager and they can actually start the conversation quite early. And they certainly identified that um, having things like the, the questionnaire um, almost gave them permission or validated them to ask the questions to say, how are you coping? And that can then lead to identifying what services might be best to help that person. Yeah, that's a good point. I should clarify when I said I'm not sure about case managers doing questionnaires. I was thinking more about the DAS and the psychological ones that maybe, yeah. And it was a, it was a big process to actually get the yeah. questionnaire to the to the worker. That uh, Rebro is designed to be self-report um, yeah. uh, questionnaire. Yeah. So I think we've seen um, a variety of models in place. So we've seen some approaches where those sorts of screening is being conducted by psychologists. We're seeing now some approaches where it's sort of automated and done through an app and completed by the worker themselves. You know, there's some approaches like the ones Ross are talking about where, you know, the case managers do some form of screening. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole variety of different approaches going, I think. So the, the next question is a little bit about that, uh, that some of that information, Alex. Um, it's, the question is, does the panel have a view about the validity of workers reporting either moderate or severe psychological distress in light of the relatively low numbers actually seeking formal treatment? That's interesting. Um, it's an interesting way of interpreting it because I'm not sure I would describe those results as saying the workers aren't actively seeking formal treatment. Um, I think there are huge barriers to access for mental health treatment in Australia, not just in, in people making workers' compensation claims, but generally, if anyone's tried to book in to see a mental health practitioner in the last two years, you would know what I'm talking about. It takes months to get appointments and to find your way into that system. It's just an overburdened system. You know, we've had a national conversation around that. So. I'm sure there are people who aren't seeking treat, who aren't receiving treatment, who are seeking treatment. Um, and I guess one of the key messages from the research that we've done and others is that, you know, we need to try to improve access. Um, so that, that's my sort of initial response to that question is I wouldn't describe it as people not seeking treatment necessarily. Um, I think I'll focus on the first part. I think we've got to take psychological distress at face value unless proven otherwise, first of all. Um, and then in, in terms, yeah, and I, I agree with Alex that, you know, that there, it is very difficult to access treatment at the moment, especially since COVID. I think the government's done a great job in saying, let's have 20 sessions of therapy accessible instead of 10. But what's, what that's done is it's filled up all the psychologists and there's not much space left for anyone else. Um, I think we've got to widen our sort of umbrella as to or a net as to who we think is appropriate to provide the psychological treatment. So I sometimes get case managers ring me saying, oh, they're not saying it's not a clinical psychologist. Is that OK? And from my perspective, like sometimes the, the social workers, the mental health nurses, they, they can do really great CBT and return to work focus CBT and pain CBT as well. So but I think a bit broader um, 
but I, I, and, I, and there's a whole host of other reasons why I think someone doesn't access treatment um, stigma um, it's the workplace's fault why should I access you know why should I have to go and speak to someone or take medication um, and heaps of other reasons so Thanks, Diana. Well, we're nearly out of time, but I've got one question, and it's and it's quite a practical question, I, I suppose. It's uh, the question is, what's your opinion on offering and encouraging a structured, supported, limited duration exercise program for clients with primary and secondary mental health claims? Great, bring it on. I love it. I love my exercise physiology. Get them moving. Get them talking. Get them out of the house. Get them doing something. Focus on functional restoration. No conflict of interest. I think it can't hurt, Russ, and it can, it can probably only help, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly if I put my physiotherapy hat on, um, we know that uh, exercise is one that uh, there's lots of evidence to support um, benefit in, in a range of conditions, and certainly, um, certainly with mental health. Yeah. Um, we've run out of time for questions. Um, there, there are one or two questions um, still uh, that people have asked. We'll actually um, aim to answer those via the platform uh, so we can reach out to people to uh, make sure we answer their questions. We'll, we'll be back in just a moment to wrap up. Thank you very much for attending the second Compare Project event in the 2022 Healthy Working Lives Seminar Series. We'll be hosting another four free events until June. Uh, you can register, register for them on this platform and you'll, if you're not able to attend them live, they'll all be available so you can watch them later. The next event will be on Wednesday, the 13th of April from 12.30. Uh, the name of that session is the critical role of insurance case managers in return to work. Uh, I'll be speaking to that um, and uh, alongside Matthew Bannon, who's the head of stakeholder engagement with WorkCover Queensland. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you at the next sessions.